We never know what will be the next outbreak or, or even pandemic, but uh, there will be one, that's for sure. This is Transmission, the podcast of the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. In this podcast, we will uncover the mysteries of diseases that impact us all and delve into the cutting-edge science of keeping people healthy. We invite you to look over the shoulders of the experts who make it their lives' mission to improve global health. In the third episode, we discuss the importance of the human factor in the transmission of infectious diseases. In this final episode of the first season of Transmission, we will answer the ultimate question. Are we ready for the next one? Transmission, your front row seat to the world of health, science and beyond. We made a few steps, I think, with, with this corona pandemic. But are we ready to... To prevent a pandemic? No. And I, I think we will never be ready to, to fully prevent a pandemic from, from emerging. This is believed to be ground zero in the swine flu the outbreak. The world is now Gloria, at the start Mexican of the 2009 the health officials are watching and waiting. And and national in 2009, swine flu formerly known as the Mexican flu, made its debut into the world. It was an adventurous flu virus that took the leap from pigs to humans and had the possibility to cause an epidemic. Pigs are infected by the same influenza viruses that can infect humans, viruses such as H1N1, for example. Jumping from pigs to humans is not such an illogical move for a virus. Humans and pigs have quite a lot in common. We share a lot of DNA and we are even experimenting with organ transplants from pigs to people. And everybody got really scared. Everybody who was interested in the topic got a bit like, oh, what's going to happen now? What are we going to do? Kathy Kreppel, epidemiologist at ITM. There was anxiety. Swine flu was something you discussed in the pub or at work. The World Health Organization sent out warnings. Everyone was on edge. And then? And then nothing happened. And everybody forgot about it. And people were angry at the World Health Organization. They said they're going to be a bit pandemic and lots of people will die and then nothing. And actually, I mean, all epidemiologists were going like, oh, thank God nothing happened. But they also went like, so why did nothing happen? Why did it not go anywhere? Um, why did it not kick off in a big way? What are the things that stopped it? Um, and how can we learn from these things to stop it next time? When a new disease hits... There is a sudden peak of interest in outbreaks and a surge in research funding. But both quickly fade when the disease starts to dwindle, leaving us unprepared for the next one. In 2013, an asteroid exploded in the atmosphere above the town of Shelyabinsk in Russia. It did so with the force of 13 nuclear bombs. More than 7,000 buildings were damaged and 1,500 people were injured. And what is more, we didn't see that asteroid coming. It was a complete surprise. If the cards had been stacked another way, the rock from space could have done a lot more damage. Stones from space sometimes skim past the Earth without anyone noticing and sometimes can mean the violent end of the dinosaur era. Not very different from diseases. Swine flu was a near miss in 2009, but near misses happen more than you think, and the world of infectious diseases is full of surprises. Mpox surprised us, and no one saw Zika or COVID coming. But in the past years, there were also outbreaks of Lassa virus, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, Hendra virus, Nipah virus, Marburg virus, West Nile virus, and many, many more. We sometimes feel that the threat of a pandemic is behind us, now that we have COVID more or less under control? Well, think again, and it can always come from unexpected uh, places. This is Lawrence Liesenborgs, infectious disease expert at ITM. So we never know what, what will be the next outbreak or, or even pandemic, but uh, there will be one, that's for sure. We had a lot of cases that unfortunately don't come into the media so much, where there was a very scary case, but the outbreak didn't happen says epidemiologist Kathy Kreppel. And we also need to understand that, why something does not kick off and happen. Because an outbreak that will hit the mark and spread to a worldwide pandemic is coming. Left, right and centre. We have, 
We have the avian influenza outbreak. But also Ebola, chikungunya, monkeypox and many others that are knocking on our door. The drum beats louder and louder. Most international organizations, WHO, uh, surveillance networks were focusing on avian flu and the pandemic was caused by coronavirus. If there's really a new pathogen, we will not see it coming. Outbreak research is essential to prepare us for the next one. But from which side should we expect the next shot? Some viruses we better keep a closer eye on, like H5N1, more familiar to you and me as bird flu. We tend to minimize the flu, but in a perfectly normal year, about 250,000 people worldwide die from the human flu virus. It's a very dangerous virus at best. At its worst moment, it's devastating. Like the Spanish flu of 1918, which killed about 50 million people in one year. The big risk with bird flu is that it would adapt to thrive in humans. And that's not so unrealistic. Flu is an RNA virus. These are viruses with a single strand of genetic information instead of the more common double-stranded DNA. This allows RNA viruses to mutate faster than any other creature on Earth. They have a trick to accomplish that feat. A flu virus consists of different pieces of RNA. And these viruses can exchange this genetic material. So if two flu virus particles infect a cell, they can exchange some of their genetic material and basically form a, an entirely new genetic constitution. And the new virus is born in the blink of an eye. And that is exactly what virologists are so worried about when it comes to bird flu viruses. Up until now, the H5N1 bird flu virus is not fully adapted for transmission from human to human. It can be transmitted from birds to humans, occasionally, but doesn't thrive in our bodies. So cases mainly remain isolated to people who are in close contact with birds. Lucky us, because between 30 and 50% of all people infected with bird flu die of the disease. That's very different from the 2% with COVID or the regular flu, where casualties remain well below 1%. So we are lucky, for now. But imagine for a moment that at some point... One person is infected with uh, human flu and, um, and gets infected with this H5N1 virus. If that happens, the patient is infected with both the bird and the common flu virus. And then H5N1 can get a shortcut. If it has two strains of flu, which exchange genetic information and transform into a new flu virus, you get a new, potentially very deadly an easily transmittable virus. And that's, I think, where, where most of us are, are a bit worried at this point. Um, the more this virus is circulating, the less we have it under control. And that is why you should really coop up your chickens when they ask you to, so that your chickens don't get bird flu from wild birds, so that consequently you don't get bird flu from your chickens, and so that in the end you can't be a walking vessel where common flu and bird flu meet to start a new global pandemic. So the question isn't, will there be another? The question is, can we handle it? It's a very different question. It's impossible to stop the perfect storm, says Cathy. It's more about reducing the risk, controlling, being prepared. Instead of fixing, stopping, preventing, we are more like... We do our best. Isabel Brosius, infectious disease expert at ITM and part of the outbreak research team, confirms. Because you can do all the research that you want, you can have all the treatments that you want, you can have everything in place, but if you can't convey the message and if people can't trust what you're saying, then you won't be able to even do anything because to control an infectious disease outbreak, you really need to people... Yeah, that are at risk to be on board with this. The handling has a lot to do with behavior, with attitude, with politics, with money, with what we think we are entitled to. Let's face it, we are not ready for the next pandemic. But after every outbreak, we learn from our mistakes and from our victories. Way too slowly and in small steps, but we learn by living through different outbreaks, like the Mpox outbreak in Belgium. The first things we did when we picked up these signals was to be ready in the sense of, okay, what do we do if a patient would present? You need to work in parallel, in real time to make sure that the care for patients goes hand in hand with the gathering of information. You need to try to 
learn as quickly as possible what's going on, who's at risk, how is this spreading. At the same time, we had a lot of practical things just to organize. We didn't know at that time like how deadly might this disease be, uh, exactly how transmissible would it be. So you need to take precautions. So you have to figure out like how do patients come in? Can they sit together with others in the in the waiting room or not? Or how will the samples go to the lab, for instance? Preparing things like frequently asked questions to put on the website to make sure that potential patients would be informed, that other stakeholder groups would be informed. There's so many things going on at the same time. Yeah, there's a lot of really practical stuff to be organized. We urgently need more outbreak research to prepare us for the next one. Research like Johan van Greensven and Alex Delamu were doing in Guinea to try to get a better understanding of Ebola. We had two chairs, very old chairs, in front of the Blood Transfusion Service. We would sit there like in the Muppet Show. Like Waldo van Stettler, the two grumpy men from the Muppet Show, Johan van Greensven and Alex Delamu would sit in their chairs and think about their priorities. What is Top priority. If we don't solve this today, we go home. In their moments of rest in an otherwise very chaotic time. In December 2013, a two-year-old toddler from a small village in Guinea was infected with Ebola after coming in contact with a bat. It's the start of the largest Ebola outbreak in history. In March, three months later, there were 49 confirmed cases and 29 deaths. By July, the disease had spread to three countries. It's the first time that Ebola had broken out of its isolated rural origins and had begun to reach densely populated areas. Everyone held their breath, as no one at the time knew how the scales would tip. Never before had this disease had so many opportunities to transmit itself to other people. One month later in August, the WHO labeled the situation a public health emergency of international concern a label reserved only for events requiring an immediate international response. During the following months, Ebola spread to seven more countries from Mali to Italy and from Spain to the United States. Ebola had jumped continents. Belgium appointed former ITM researcher Erika Vlieger as national Ebola coordinator. Everyone was in full outbreak mode, yet two and a half years after the first case was found, the disease disappeared into the forest again leaving more than 11,000 people dead. Nobody saw it coming as the next pandemic. Nobody expected it to be so big, but it was. And somewhere in the midst of all the chaos of Ebola outbreaks and transmissions, Alex and Johan are sitting on a chair in front of a blood transfusion center in Guinea. They want to know if plasma from Ebola survivors can help in the fight against the virus. It's a project that always seems to raise more challenges than they can solve. And sometimes it's just best to sit in the chair for a while to get your priorities straight. One of the challenges Johan and Alex were facing was the production of plasma itself. That seemed a tough nut to crack. The National Blood Transfusion Service had been receiving very little funding, so the basic fertilities were very limited. But they needed a place to produce the plasma. Because without plasma, no plasma therapy. It seemed like one of those problems that would be impossible to solve. Until one day, the head of the blood transfusion center received a phone call. It was a minister on the phone. An airplane has arrived containing a big container. The container was fully equipped with everything on board to organize plasma collection according to the best standards. You're struggling how to organize it locally and suddenly there's a huge truck with top-notch equipment arriving. One of the many problems solved. Time to start the day and tackle the other challenges. An outbreak like Ebola is always unexpected. If you want to do outbreak research or learn lessons for future outbreaks, you have to be quick. You have to drop everything, travel to the scene and do it faster than you have the time to arrange things properly. For the first three months, we took money with us in our underwear. There was no system to to transfer the money. Sometimes Johan and Alex exchanged money in a bank and walked out with 10 kilos of banknotes in their pockets. Money they needed to run their everyday life in Guinea but also money that needed to be counted and managed. It was a hassle. A funny story, maybe. No, Johan says. It creates a lot of stress. 
at that point in time, it's not funny. Uh, afterwards, it's funny. <laughs> but at that point in time, yeah, there's so many other things you have to do urgently. Researching outbreaks is a challenge for everyone. It felt a bit like you're dropped in a war zone without arms. But you have to survive. And that's what we did every day. It was very stressful. Yeah. So I don't think it's healthy. <laughs> outbreak research might be heavy, but every outbreak sets us on a path to a better understanding of these events. So if you look at it in a positive way, yes, we learn each time. If you look at it in a negative way, we could have learned much more. I think that there's, there's a lot of hope. Says Lawrence Liesenborgs. And especially from Africa, what we see in our collaboration with African partners, I think a lot is changing. Yeah, this is also my main objective. It was to, to create a critical mass of researchers. So when I started, I was the only PhD. And when I start, my priority was to train a lab technician. This is Jean-Jacques Mouyembe who was one of the scientists who first discovered Ebola. So I sent some of them here at ITM. Others went to the um, United Kingdom in London and, uh, and uh, also in the Institute Pasteur in Africa. So by cooperation, I have a lot of partners here in Europe, United States, in Japan, and, and, and so on. So uh, I sent uh, some of them, and now they are back because... At the NRB, we have also a very good environment for research. So they decided to come back. And now we are more than 30. Recently, Muyembe and a team of researchers even discovered a treatment for Ebola, a long-standing dream of his. If I remember well, when I was a PhD student at the University of Leuven, my work was to treat mice that were infected with a different virus, so when I returned to DRC, my dream was to, to, to say, can I put into practice my expertise to treat humans who are infected with virus? Ebola was, for me, this opportunity. For decades, Muyembe worked on this mysterious disease until recently they discovered a cure. When we uh, treated the first two patients, the result was uh, extraordinary. The two patients received only one injection, and one day later, they asked to eat. So they were able to eat. And after that, we treated uh, eight other patients, and it was ex successful. So it was fantastic. And after that, it was uh, approved by our FDA, United States, as a treatment of uh, Ebola for adults and for children. So uh, for me, this was my dream. Uh, this dream is now a reality. Ebola is a curable disease. There is an enormous buildup of expertise in the countries with which ITM cooperates, not only in Africa, but also in Asia and Latin America. It's expertise coming from trained people who are in contact with outbreaks day in and day out. And that is hopeful. So the time we have now is the time to prepare, to prepare, to train people in the world. Maybe we will not be very, very ready, but it is, it is a good preparation. The first time I came to Belgium, I was a, a young medical uh, doctor. And then I got training from Belgium in master's level and also PhD level. Says Alex Delamou, the alumni of ITM who worked with Johan van Greensven during the Ebola outbreak of 2014. Alex went back to Guinea and used that knowledge. To improve things in my, my country, now I am a, a full professor in my university where I teach, where I share the knowledge that I learn in, uh, in Belgium and in other settings. Alex is now senior researcher in Guinea and professor of public health at the Africa Center of Excellence. He now combines a good understanding of outbreaks with a deep expertise in public health, making sure our health systems can withstand the next pandemic and won't break down. Dr. Muyembe again. It is important to strengthen the capacity of African countries because I think the next pandemic will come from Africa. So if Africa is able to detect early, it will be the best for the world.
But if Africa is not strong, the disease will spread quickly in the world. We need strong health systems and a network of partners to be connected and to share results quickly. This is very, very, very important. And also to have some kind of equity, you know. Like with COVID, we didn't receive reagents because all the reagent was uh, sent to industrialized countries in Europe, in the United States, and so on. Even the vaccine. So we say first our people here in Europe, and after that, we'll send to Africa. So this kind of equity is very, very important to, to have, not only for vaccine, but also for reagent, for diagnostic, and also uh, medicine and, and, and so on. So, will there be a next pandemic? Yes. Do you need to lie awake at night worrying about an outbreak? Don't let the possible threat of a new pandemic um, define the way you live. Don't do that. But just be aware that, that this COVID pandemic is not, is not a single event. Every day, people are working on managing outbreaks. From the social scientist in Cambodia, to the researchers stuck in the mud in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and from the virologist in the lab, to the epidemiologist behind a computer, or the researcher in a tent underneath a tree filled with snakes. Monitoring systems are set up all around the world. It's going to be an exciting time. Experts are keeping track. Let's hope they are ready to sound the alarm when the time comes. In the next season of this podcast, we will travel around the world again in search of new stories and surprising discoveries. The whole world is our playing field and we have to collaborate because if we don't work together to improve health systems across the globe, then uh, we should not be surprised that problems will come from where the health systems are weak. If diseases emerge in vulnerable health systems and then spread rapidly around the world, how do you ensure that the whole world is on board? How do you ensure that health systems and the people who work in them do not crack under the chaos? That is a story for next season. Thanks for listening. This was the final episode of this season of Transmission. Please join us next season. For more information on the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, please go to itg.be slash podcast.